Hi guys, for those of you who have not yet met me, my name is Casey Havakis and I am one of the Regional Dairy Specialists with Cornell Cooperative Extension North Country Regional I Team. Throughout this presentation and two others that will, that will follow this one, I'm going to be presenting some of the results from my graduate studies research that I conducted at the University of Guelph under the supervision of Dr. Trevor DeVries. This research has recently been published in the Journal of Dairy Science, and you can find the reference at the end of the presentation. Before I dive in, I want to acknowledge and give a big shout out to Trevor for all of his help and guidance in facilitating this research. These videos would not be available to you without his support and mentorship. All right, so my master's research focused on manipulating characteristics of high straw dry cow diets to promote consistency and in intake and performance for dairy cows across the transition period. This research was done in three parts, the first of which I'll be presenting in this video. And this part specifically looked at the impact of chop length of wheat straw in these high straw dry cow diets on cow performance across the transition period. The transition period is defined as three weeks pre-calving to three weeks post-calving, and it's characterized by a sudden and dramatic demand for nutrients that's accompanied by a lag in dry matter intake. This puts cows in a state of negative energy balance, or as seen by the yellow area on the graph, the energy gap. Negative energy balance is an inevitable state that all cows will experience during early lactation. And while it is an inevitable thing that all cows will experience, we can control the severity and the duration of time that cows spend in negative energy balance. So the more severe the negative energy balance is, or the longer that they're experiencing it, the higher risk they'll have of developing further metabolic diseases such as ketosis. So a lot of research has been focused on how to encourage dry matter intake in early lactation to try to minimize the severity of negative energy balance. But more recently, we learned that the diet consumed by dry cows can be equally important in terms of stimulating intake in early lactation. And so one strategy to minimize the severity of negative energy balance is to try to increase dry matter intake in the dry period. But it's also important to note that if cows are over consuming energy in the dry period or they're gaining excessive body condition, they're going to be at greater risk of experiencing metabolic disease after calving. So the key is to increase dry matter intake while also controlling for energy consumption, while also providing a diet that the cows actually like and want to consume. Controlled energy dry cow diets have been explored for the past decade. These diets are more commonly referred to as the Goldilocks diet, and it's based on the concept of not too much and not too little. These diets typically have a high straw content, and they're designed to allow the cow to maximize her intake while controlling her energy consumption. Because straw has such low nutritive value, it basically just fills up the cow without increasing her energy consumption. From a physiological standpoint, these diets are really great. Research has shown that cows freshen well and have fewer metabolic diseases relative to other diets that allow the cow to overconsume energy. But from a behavioral standpoint, issues arise when we consider what straw actually is and what it is to the cow. So these high straw diets are bulky and low in moisture. This can lead to a decrease in dry matter intake due to gut fill. And because cows perceive straw to be unpalatable, it can lead to an increase in sorting. So a majority of the sorting research has been done on lactating diets, and we know that cows will typically sort in favor of the fine grain component and against the lo longer forage particles. This is gonna increase the risk of consuming an imbalanced diet, not only for the cow that's actually physically sorting, but also for the more subordinate cows that may feed later in the day and are forced to feed, the feed on the refused feed. So when cows consume more of the fine grain component relative to the longer forage particles, they're at risk of experiencing ruminal acidosis, which we also know has detrimental impacts on milk production and butter fat. But the risk is low during the dry period, and especially whenever we're feeding these high straw dry cow diets. So why should we care if the cows are sorting in the dry period? Well, previous research done with calves has shown that if calves learn a behavior prior to a dietary change, they're more likely to carry that behavior over following the dietary change than if they never learned it in the first place. So it could be thought that if cows learn the sorting behavior in the dry period when the risk of acidosis is low, they may be more at risk of carrying that sorting behavior over 
once they transition onto the lactating diet when the risk of acidosis is high. And so one of the strategies that's been extensively explored to minimize sorting of lactating diets is minimizing forage particle size. But the same has not been done for dry cow diets. So this led us to our research objective, which was to determine if pre-calving dry matter intake could be improved and maintained post-calving, if feed sorting could be discouraged, and if post-calving performance could be improved by manipulating characteristics of high straw dry cow diets. In this case, part one, we looked at the effect of chop length of wheat straw in these high straw dry cow diets on behavior, health, and performance of dairy cows across the transition period. And we hypothesized that the shorter chopped wheat straw would improve intake, reduce sorting, and improve metabolic health and performance after calving. This research was done at the Allura Research Station Dairy Facility, which is at the University of Guelph in Ontario, Canada. 40 cows were enrolled at dry up, which was approximately 42 days before calving, and we followed them for 28 days after calving. Cows were assigned to their dietary treatment at dry up, which was a dry cow diet that contained about 29% wheat straw on a dry matter basis and had straw chopped with either a 10.16 centimeter screen or a 2.54 centimeter screen. Once the straw was mixed into the diet, we then had our treatment diets, which is either the long diet or the short diet. After calving, all cows were fed the same lactating TMR. So this is really important to consider as we move forward and look at the results. The dietary treatment was only in the dry period and after calving, all cows were fed the same diet. And so in terms of data collection, we were able to collect daily dry matter intake and feeding behavior using these electronic feed bins. And we collected body weights biweekly in the dry period and daily after calving. We took blood samples and used those blood samples to measure beta hydroxybutyrate and non-esterified fatty acids, both of which are markers of energy balance. We assessed rumen pH using wireless telemetry probes that continuously logged pH at 15 minute intervals. And we then combined all of the data into one continuous record and summarized it by cow. And we also collected feed samples to calculate sorting. So feed sorting was calculated using the Penn State particle separator, which separates feed into four different fractions based on particle size. So we have our long, medium, short, and fine particles, and then we calculated sorting as a percentage of the intake that that cow actually consumed, divided by the predicted intake, or divided by the predicted amount based on the fresh feed sample, and then we multiplied that by 100. Values that were less than 100 indicate sorting occurred against that fraction, and values greater than 100 indicate that sorting occurred in favor of that fraction. All stats were done using SAS 9.4 and data was summarized by status. So we separated them into dry or lactating groups and then analyzed the data using the mixed procedure. We also modeled the change in dry matter intake and rumen pH and did an analysis of covariance to see if there was a significant linear quadratic or cubic effect of day. Okay, so moving on to the results, all the graphs will have a similar layout as this with cows on the short treatment being shown in red and cows on the long treatment being shown in blue. The day or week relative to calving will be along the x-axis and the variable of interest will be along the y-axis. So this graph in particular is showing dry matter intake across the transition period. So in the dry period, cows on the short treatment had significantly higher intake compared to cows on the long treatment. But after calving, there was no difference. But what's really interesting to note is this drop in intake as cows approach calving. So if we zoom in on this, we can see that starting around day five, cows on the long treatment started to experience a greater drop in intake compared to cows on the short treatment. So this is consistent with our hypothesis that when fed the shorter chopped straw, cows would be able to maintain more consistent intake as they approached calving. Now, if we take a look at sorting, just a reminder that anything that's over 100 indicates that cows sorted in favor of that fraction. 
and then anything below 100 indicates that they sorted against it. So it's not surprising to see that regardless of treatment, cows sorted against the long forage particles. The cows on the long treatment actually sorted to a greater extent than cows on the short treatment. There was no difference for the medium and short fractions, but then once we take a look at the fine fraction, this is actually surprising to see. So cows on the long treatment did not sort for or against this fraction, but cows on the short treatment actually sorted against it. So usually we see cows sorting in favor of this fraction, but we think that because the short, the short diet had so many straw fines that were contributing to the fine fraction, cows actually sorted against it, and we are hypothesizing that this is because cows just don't like straw fines. Okay, so we also looked at sorting every day for the first seven days after calving. Now on this graph, the data summarized across treatments rather than having the treatments being compared. But what's interesting to see here and the point I wanna make here is that for the first week after calving, we see the opposite results that we would expect to see. So cows sort in favor of, and actually quite a bit in favor of, the long forage particles for the first seven days after calving, and they actually sort against the fine forage particles for the first seven days. So this is really interesting to see that once they transition onto a rapidly fermentable high grain diet, they're actually sorting more in favor of the forage particles, and this is likely to try to attenuate um, the negative effects of the rumen that they're experiencing from the transition onto this diet. Okay, so in terms of rumen pH, the long treatment cows had a greater drop in pH after calving. So again, if we take a look at the day relative to calving right around day zero, the cows on the long treatment had quite a bit of a steeper drop in rumen pH compared to cows on the short treatment. And this is likely attributed to the cows on the short treatment maintaining better intake as they approach calving and having better rumen health in those seven days leading up to calving. So moving on to some of the blood metabolites that we looked at. So there was no statistical difference in blood non-esterified fatty acids, which is a marker of energy balance. But it is interesting to see here the numerical difference. So in week one, the long treatment cows and short treatment cows were right around the same level. And then week two, three, and four, the cows in the short treatment had a bit of a drop and then continuously declined, whereas cows in the long treatment maintained a little bit higher levels. And then when we look at beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is a marker of ketosis, we can see that there was no difference in the dry period, which is expected. And then after calving, cows on the Short treatment maintained relatively stable BHB levels across the four weeks. The cows on the long treatment actually spiked in their BHB levels three weeks after calving. So again, this is probably because cows on the short treatment were able to maintain more consistent intake in that week leading up to calving, whereas cows on the long treatment had a bit more of a drop. Um, some previous research has shown that if cows are able to maintain better intakes leading up to calving, they're gonna have better metabolic health after calving. And this is confirmed and supported by the results that we saw here. Okay, just, so to wrap up part one, some general conclusions. Uh, the shorter straw chop length resulted in improved dry matter intake in the dry period. It reduced the drop in intake in the week leading up to calving. It reduced feed sorting against the long forage particles. It stabilized room and pH around the time of calving. And it improved energy balance three weeks after calving. So all of which are pretty good indicators that the forage particle size in your dry cow diet does matter. And if you're able to get it chopped shorter, um, that can result in some really beneficial things for your cows. So with that, I just wanna thank um, Dr. Trevor DeVries once again, as well as Dr. Gail Carpenter and Dr. Todd Duffield for being on my master's advisory committee, as well as our sponsors, NSERC Trial Nutrition and OMAFRA. And if you have any questions, please direct them to myself and I will either answer them to the best of my ability or reach out to Trevor. Um, and as promised, below is listed the reference for the Journal of Dairy Science article where you can find more details on this specific research project.
Thank you for listening and please tune in for my next videos, which will go over parts two and three of my master's research.